Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to this afternoon's Mailers Hub webinar. Uh, we have a very, very special presenter today, uh, Andy Paparosi from uh, SGIA, and we still see people logging in. So we'll give them a chance to gather up their coffee or their lunch or their breakfast or whatever they're having and, and get themselves settled. Um, before we do that, I want to make sure everyone's aware of the fact that the, uh, the presentation today will be recorded and the recordings will be available to Mailers Hub subscribers. Uh, we're also making available, or Andy's made available, a copy of his presentation, which you can see right there, and that will be available for you um, as part of your attendance today. Uh, so with that in mind, let me uh, introduce Andy. First of all, um, uh, let me first thank him first of all for his, his thoughtfulness in, in doing this today. Um, I've been fortunate to know Andy for for a number of years, and he is the, the definition of a gentleman. If you look in the dictionary under the word gentle person, gentleman, his picture's right there. So I have to thank him for his, for his, for his kindness and his thoughtfulness over the years. And, and to give him the formal introduction, uh, he is the chief economist at SGIA, especially Graphic Imaging Association. Uh, his responsibilities include analyzing and reporting on the trends, uh, whether economic, techno technological, social, or demographic that will define the printing industry's future, any actions company owners can take to make those trends opportunities rather than threats. And of course, as we all know, printing is akin to mailing. Mailing stuff comes from printers. So we're all, and nowadays we're all part of one big happy industry. Uh, Andy's most important responsibility, of course, is being an observer of our industry, listening carefully to the issues and concerns of company owners, executives, and managers. Uh, Andy joined SGI in July 2018. Previously, he worked 31 years at the National Association for Printing Leadership, NAPL, which of course had joined with AMSP to become Epicom and so forth. Uh, and, and at NAPL, he developed the Association's State of the Industry Series, Capital Investment Report, and numerous other studies on the commercial printing industry's performance and prospects. He's also taught mathematics, statistics, and economics at various colleges. Uh, Andy is a Phi Beta Kappa, summa cum laude graduate of Boston College, go Boston, holds a BA degree in economics and a master's degree in economics with concentrations in ec ec econometrics and public finance from Columbia University. So clearly, uh, Andy is among the smart people that we're all very pleased and honored to have uh, in our circle of friends and, and, and coworkers. So uh, with that in mind, uh, Andy, I will turn the, turn the controls over to you. Please continue with today's presentation. Well, thank you so much, Leo, and thank you for uh, those kind words and, and for including me in today's program. It's, it's my privilege to be here. Uh, good afternoon, all, and welcome to our webinar, the Economic Outlook 2020. And let's get right to the outlook. The American economy is likely to slow further in 2020, but not collapse into recession. Specifically, the 39 economists surveyed quarterly by the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia expect GDP to grow 1.8% next year, down from 2.3% this year and 2.9% next year, uh, last year. And I know what you're thinking, who, who cares? Uh, what's the difference? 2% growth, 3% growth, and for a million dollar or a $10 million or a $100 million company, there isn't much difference. But we're not talking about a million dollar or a $10 million or a $100 million company. We are talking about the $19.1 trillion American economy. And the $19.1 trillion American economy growing by 2% reduces GDP by approximately $210 billion from what it would have been had growth continued at 3%. Now, to put that loss in perspective, last year, manufacturers of paper products had sales of $193 billion dollars. TV and radio broadcasters, $170 billion, and beverage manufacturers, sales of $105 billion. So the slowdown we're talking about from approximately 3% growth last year to slightly less than 2% growth next year, 
is the equivalent of losing a major industry. That's why it matters. And we have three questions to answer. Question number one, why did the economy slow this year? Question number two, why is it likely to slow further next year? And I'll give you a hint. The drag created by, by trade disputes, or what I prefer to call international economic brinksmanship, because that's what it is, the drag caused by the trade disputes and severe shortages of skilled labor will have a lot to do with it. And question number three, why further slowing in 2020, but no recession? And we have to answer those questions, even though the headline numbers have recently been very good. For example, the economy added 266,000 jobs in November. That was a blowout number, far beyond the consensus forecast. And the economy added a solid 615,000 jobs over the last three months. Moreover, retail sales, an important measure of consumer sentiment, is up a healthy 4% since August. However, and that's all good news, but did you know that during the three months prior to the Great Recession of 2007-2009, the economy added 280,000 jobs and retail sales increased 4.6%? One year later, everything had changed. And my point is that trouble often creeps in when the headline numbers are still very encouraging. So let's not rely on the headlines alone. Let's look beneath the headlines to figure out what's really happening with the economy and what's likely ahead. And when we do, we see a couple of things. First, we see that everything was going so well. Uh, the economy accelerated rapidly through 2017 and into 2018. In fact, GDP grew 3.2% during the six months ending September 30th, 2018. That's the, the high bar right in the middle of this chart. So the economy was growing at its fastest rate in four years, and then everything changed. Growth began to slow and has slowed considerably ever since. And we just talked about the difference between the economy growing by 3.2%, and growing at 2.2%. So what happened? Well, very simply, international economic brinksmanship happened. Uh, in January of last year, we targeted solar panels, washing machines, steel and aluminum. China came back and hit our agricultural products and aluminum waste products, the European Union, targeted our cranberries and bourbon, Harley-Davidson motorcycles and jeans. Canada targeted our steel and aluminum, agricultural products, food products. And over the next 22 months, everything from luggage to yachts was added to the tariff hit list. Tariff hikes were announced. Some were enforced. Some were delayed. Exemptions were granted. Some were honored, some were rescinded, some were replaced by import quotas. I mean, who knew what was next? How do you do business with this kind of uncertainty? And as the uncertainty created by the brinksmanship spread, capital investment took a big hit. Businesses that are dependent on issuing in international markets thought, well, maybe I better hold off on that equipment upgrade or plant expansion I was planning because one of my main products or one of the inputs I need to produce whatever it is I'm producing may be, may be next up for a tariff hit. So capital investment, and by that I mean equipment, software, and structures. So capital investment, which had grown robustly through the mid-2018, uh, mid uh, aided by an accelerating economy, streamlined regulation, lower corporate taxes, and rising business confidence, actually decreased five-tenths of a percent during the six months ending this past September. So you can see a dramatic 
change in capital investment. And again, primarily because of the uncertainty created by the international economic brinksmanship. And this matters a lot because capital investment creates the foundation for sustained economic growth. Consumer spending gets all the attention because it accounts for nearly 70% of GDP. So we are constantly hearing that it's all about the consumer, but it, it isn't. A, certainly a healthy consumer is essential to a healthy American economy, but capital investment, not consumer spending, creates the foundation for sustained economic growth by boosting productivity, which in turn creates non-inflationary income growth that supports healthy consumer spending. It's a virtuous cycle. And if we do anything to disrupt that cycle, we burden and impede the economy. And that's basically what's happened over the last year. The brinksmanship, the uncertainty it's created, the disruptions to international trade markets have interrupted capital, expend, uh, capital spending, dramatically dampened capital expending, spending, interrupted this virtuous cycle and slowed the economy significantly. Corporate profits have also taken a big hit. After tax corporate profits, and again, I think you're starting to see a, a trend in the three graphs I've shown so far. The economy, capital investment, corporate profits, all accelerating through 2017 and into 2018. Corporate profits were growing rapidly following passage of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. But as the brinksmanship disrupted the international markets, so important to large cap American corporations, did you know that the S&P 500 generate more than 40% of their revenue from overseas. So as the brinksmanship disrupted the international markets so important to major American corporations, margin growth declined dramatically. So we have capital investment slowing dramatically. We have corporate profits slowing dramatically. Well, why hasn't the slowdown been more severe? Basically because exceptionally tight labor markets have boosted compensation. Specifically, as this graph shows, wages and salaries increased 4.8% during the first three quarters of 2019. Now, that is, that is down from a 5.4% increase during the same period a year earlier, but it's still healthy. It's still enough to keep consumer spending relatively strong and to offset at least part of the effects of the sharp decline in capital investment and uh, corporate profits. But, but here's where the story gets, gets confusing. And this is where we have to really look at a lot more than the headline numbers. Because... On the one hand, a healthy demand for labor that supports meaningful compensation gains is essential to a healthy economy. After all, you, you don't grow an economy by impoverishing people. All right, we, we all agree on that. However, when labor shortages become so severe that employers have to hire pretty much anyone who comes along and labor turnover spikes because pretty much anyone can get a few more bucks working somewhere else, productivity and profitability take a big hit. And when productivity and profitability take a big hit, eventually so do hiring, compensation, and consumer spending. Again, we interrupt that virtuous cycle I showed you earlier. 
the reality is, and again, this is not the kind of thing you're going to hear in the news. It's not the kind of thing that makes headlines. But the reality is, at some point, labor shortages become a drag on the economy when they become so severe that we have to hire people that are very, very short in terms of the skills we require. And we train these people and we get them up to speed and then they take off for a few more bucks somewhere else, creating all kinds of of costs and inefficiencies. At that point, labor shortages now become a drag on the economy. Now we may be approaching that point. Now look at this table. Consumer spending increased 2.5% during the first nine months of this year. And that's, that's good. It's not spectacular, but it's good. Additionally, spending for durables, cars, appliances, furnitures, uh, consumer uh, electronics, all that expensive stuff increased 4.4%. And, and that's important because it's, it's not simply how much consumers are spending. It's not simply how much consumers are buying, it's what they are buying. So we like to look at consumer durables as a sign of consumer confidence. If consumers are spending on appliances and cars and furniture and consumer electronics, that's a pretty good sign that they're feeling well about themselves. And again, 4.4% isn't bad. But notice it's down significantly from 7.1% a year ago. 2.5% growth for total consumer spending isn't bad at all, but it's down significantly from 3.1% one year ago. Same with employment. The economy added 1.5 million jobs through September 30th. Again, still positive. I'm not saying it's not positive. Still positive, but not as positive as a year ago. So we, we, we need to ask, are we reaching that tipping point where labor shortages are so severe that they become a drag on the economy? We're going to have to watch this very, very closely. I'm not going to be in the headlines but I'm going to give you a few indicators at the end of our presentation that are going to help us track this and measure how much of a drag labor shortages are creating for the economy. And then we have the whole issue of uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty, like change, is always with us. Uh, and we tend to talk about change as if it's always the same. Uh, but, but change isn't always the same. There are degrees of change. There is gradual, uh, manageable change, and then there is rapid disruptive change. And our industry has seen a lot of the rapid disruptive kind over the last 10 years. Well, it's the same thing with uncertainty. Of course, uncertainty is always with us. We never know for sure what's ahead, but there are different degrees of uncertainty. Uh, there is the everyday uncertainty for which we can plan, and then there is the extraordinary uncertainty, which leaves us wondering, where is all this going? Now, the flexible, adaptable American economy can adjust to practically anything given time, but an extraordinary uncertainty slows the economy, acts as a drag on the economy as businesses of all types and sizes wait for clarity. And, and we have, in my opinion, and again, this is not something that's going to make the headlines, but my opinion, we have a whole lot of extraordinary uncertainty right now acting as a drag on the economy. We have, as mentioned earlier, the uncertainty from the ongoing international economic brinksmanship. And I, I know 
last Friday, we reached a phase one agreement with China, and that's very positive. Maybe that means the tensions have peaked. Maybe that means we're pulling back from the brink. But it's not a guarantee of anything. Nothing has been signed yet. Remember, we thought last May that we had a comprehensive deal. And China reneged on the concessions they made in that deal. And there's no guarantee that they will not renege on the concessions they made in phase one. If they renege in the concessions they made in phase one, what are we going to do? President Trump structured the deal so that if China reneges on the promises they made on the phase one agreement signed last Friday, tariff increases snap right back on Chinese products. And then where are we? We're back where we started. And even if this all works out, China honors the phase one agreements and we move on to a more comprehensive phase two agreement, even if this all works out, it's going to take time for the international economy to heal from the disruptions and distortions of the last two years. So even if this all works out, we're not likely to see the benefits until sometime in the second half of 2020. And again, this even if it all works out is, is a, a, a big question. You know, we, we thought we had a deal with China back in May, and in fact, we didn't. So we have uncertainty still, despite the, again, the positive headlines of just last week. We also have uncertainty from the elections. Uh, who is going to win the presidency? Which party will win the Senate? Which party will win the House? What economic policies will the winners pursue? Uh, the candidates have very different visions of what's best for America. They all want what's best for America. They just have very, very different thoughts on how to get there. And the common response to extraordinary uncertainty, it's just human nature. The common response to extraordinary uncertainty is to wait for clarity. Now, the opportunity is to create clarity. But the natural human tendency is to sit tight until things clear up, until the future becomes a little more certain. And that tendency to just sit tight and wait and try and get a better handle on where the elections are headed, where the trade war is headed, that tendency will create another drag on the economy in 2020, contributing not to recession again, but to further slowing. So our third question, further slowing, but why no recession? And you all remember, all you have to do is go back to last August. And I think it was right around August 16th, 17th, 18th that the yield curve inverted. Shorter term interest rates rose above long term interest rates. And all you heard in the press was that we're headed for recession. And I never thought there was going to be a recession in 2020 back in August. And I certainly don't think there's going to be a recession in 2020 in mid December. Uh, the American economy, that's true. The American economy has now grown for 125 consecutive months, making the current upturn the longest on, on record. So what do we keep hearing? You keep hearing it and I keep hearing it. Doesn't that mean we are due for a recession? And the answer very simply is absolutely not. That's, that's utter nonsense. Uh, and let's understand two facts about recession. First of all, we are never, ever due for recession. Economic expansions do not die of old age, and recessions don't just happen. Recessions have very specific causes, three in particular. Number one, 
some kind of excess is created in the economy. For example, the real estate bubble prior to the Great Recession of 2007-2009, or the dot-com bubble prior to the recession of 2001, some kind of excess bubbles up somewhere in the economy. Reason number two, a policy error. Somebody makes a mistake. Maybe the Fed tightens monetary policy too much. Maybe there's a poorly designed, poorly timed, poorly executed tax increase. Or may, maybe there's some kind of in, innovation stifling regulation. Somebody makes a policy error. And reason number three is some kind of exogenous shock to the economy. And the most recent example I can give you is the OPEC oil embargoes of the 70s, um, because we don't see that happen very much anymore. The American economy has become so flexible and so adaptable that we're not nearly as susceptible to exogenous shocks as we were. The second fact about recessions is that recessions are not and never have been black swans. I frequently hear the Great Recession of 2007-2009 referred to as a black swan. And it was indeed the deepest, most disruptive recession in decades, but it wasn't a black swan. The warning signs were all there. The mispricing of risk, the complex interdependencies uh, created as that risk spread across global financial markets, the lack of an effective fail-safe system to contain the risk. A whole bunch of people pointed this out to us, including Richard Bookstaber in his book, A Demon of Our Own Design, Markets, Hedge Funds, and the perils of financial innovation. And if you ever want to know why you shouldn't base your economic forecasts on the consensus or headline, read his book, A Demon of Our Own Design. Folks like him pointed out the problems that eventually led to the Great Recession a year before they drove the economy into the ground. But what happens? We dismiss them as fear mongers. Why? because the headline numbers were still strong. Again, this is why we have to look beyond the headlines if we want to understand where the economy really is and where it's likely headed. Oops. So why no recession in 2020? I just said there are three reasons recessions happen. Number one, some kind of excess is created somewhere in the economy. There is no evidence of an excess severe enough to cause a recession in 2020. Number two, somebody makes a policy mistake. The Fed was on the verge of making a policy mistake when they tightened interest rates last year and into early 2019, but they reversed themselves. They stopped themselves in time. And they've clearly stopped tightening credit, and they have no intention of tightening credit anytime soon. And as I said earlier, exogenous shocks, reason number three, the increasingly diverse, adaptable American economy is not nearly as susceptible to shocks as it once was. So again, in my opinion, none of the factors that cause recession are in place not for 2020. And one other thing, did you know that there is one economic indicator that has declined sharply in the 12 months prior to every recession since 1960? Only one indicator has done that. And I can ask you what that indicator is, and you might say the yield curve, but that wouldn't be true. You might say consumer spending, but that would be wrong. The one indicator that has declined a year before every single recession since 1960, all eight of them, 
is housing starts. And it kind of makes sense because for all the ways the American economy has changed over the last six decades, one thing hasn't changed. People still buy houses. And think of the impact a new home has on the economy. It employs electricians, roofers, masons, carpenters, painters, siders, plumbers. You buy new appliances. You need new carpeting. Now, this does not mean, and I, I want to make this clear, it is absolutely true that housing starts have declined without exception prior to every recession since 1960. But it is also absolutely true that this does not mean housing starts will definitely collapse before the next recession. No economic indicator is perfect and every recession is different, but that housing starts are rising again. They were falling through uh, early and into mid-2019, and maybe that contributed also to some of the concern about recession. But that they are rising again is very positive. So for all those reasons, we expect, or I expect, further slowing of the economy because of the drag of um, uh, extraordinary uncertainty, because of the drag created by extreme shortages of, of skilled personnel, but not recession. Now, having said that, I want us all to understand that the seeds of the next recession are most likely already in place. Somewhere out there, the cause of the next recession is already in place. Now, what, what would that cause likely be? Well, I, I, I don't know for sure. It could be extreme shortages of labor, dampening productivity, dampening corporate profits, disrupting the virtuous cycle I mentioned earlier, or it could be something else. And I'm pretty sure you're hearing about this in the news occasionally anyway. The other thing that could be the cause of the next recession is excessive debt, both private debt and public debt. Now, again, I want to say, Nothing suggests that debt, public or private, is going to cause a recession in 2020. But it's got the potential to cause a recession sometime after. Let's, let's take a closer look at debt. It's not just public debt. We, we all know how irresponsible our federal government is. It's also corporate debt. This graphic tracks total debt outstanding, all maturities held by non-financial American corporations. And as you can see from the inset, corporate debt now totals $6.4 trillion, up almost 70% since the end of the Great Recession. And again, I, I, I don't know why this would surprise anyone. What, what's happened the last 10 years? The Fed has kept interest rates historically low to aid in recovery from the Great Recession. Well, what, what did you think historically low interest rates were going to do? They encourage borrowing, lots of it. And, and if I, I, we looked more closely at, at the debt markets, the corporate debt markets, you'd see that markets for triple B rated debt and junk have been particularly strong as what? As investors reach for yield. Now, one day, interest rates are going to start rising again. And when they do, the cost of servicing this debt is going to be increasingly burdensome. And that is going to severely impact profitability, the profitability that supports investment, and hiring and the economy at large. That's the private sector, the corporate part of the uh, debt that I think has 
great potential to be the cause of the next recession. Now, look at let's look at the government component of the debt. Our federal government now has a debt that exceeds $22 trillion. And it's not, and again, I, I think this is also where the consensus, the headline misses the point. The point is not that America is ever going to default on her public debt. We're not going to ever not be able to refinance our public debt. However, did you know that net annual interest payments on that $22 trillion debt now exceed $370 billion? Did you know that that is more than our total defense spending or our total spending on non-entitlement discretionary programs? So, as I say, America is not going to default on our debt or be unable to refinance our debt. However, the rising cost of servicing this rapidly rising record federal debt is going to absorb resources that could have been invested in infrastructure or education or renewable energy or something else that would enhance the economy's productivity and long-term growth potential. That's where the problem is. And it's enough of a problem so that I put in another slide that takes a closer look at um, the U.S. government debt. You, you probably know that the U.S. government debt has two components. There's um, a component that is held within the U.S. government. That's the black bars you see. That's what's called debt held internally. It's debt that one part of the government owes to another part. And in almost all cases, it's debt held in government trust funds, such as Social Security. And that part doesn't really affect us very much because the debt, represent, uh, debt represents assets to the part of the federal government that owns it, like the Social Security fund, but a liability to the part of the government to which it is owed. Um, so it really has no net effect on our overall finances. This this intra-government debt, it's just debt that one part of the government owes to the other part of the government. The big problem is those red bars. Do you see the red bars? That's debt held by the public. That's debt our government, well, us, the taxpayers, that's debt we, the government owes to somebody. It includes debt held by individuals, businesses, banks, insurance companies, uh, state and local governments, pension funds, mutual funds, foreign governments, foreign business, foreign individuals. Again, this red bar, and I put it in red for a reason. I wanted to create alarm. Uh, that set of red bars, this Debt held by the public is what our government owes somebody else. And now notice, notice what happens. What happened in the um, in the inset on the right hand side of the chart? Notice that debt held by the public—that's the part of the debt we really have to worry about—has increased. Listen to this: two hundred thirty-one percent since two thousand seven the last year before the Great Recession. Now, granted, you would expect the federal government to take on more debt during the deepest economic downturn since the Great, Rece uh, Great Depression. However, notice that debt has continued to increase since 2010. The year after the Great Recession ended, 2010, since then, this, this debt held by the public has increased 86.6%. So we can't blame the recession. It's ongoing. Through the longest expansion on record, we're still piling up 
unprecedented amounts of debt. And, and I just wanted to show you one more way, because this is important. This is a concern. I have one more chart, public debt as a percent of GDP. Why do I show you that? Because as with households, what matters is not so much the absolute dollar value of debt. It's your ability to service that debt. Simply put, someone who makes $100,000 can safely take on more debt than someone who makes $25,000. So it is with countries. So the real concern, or I, I think the most insightful measure of, of why we should be concerned is right here. And again, I put these bars in red to, to create a sense of urgency. This is our public debt, the debt held by the public. Our government owes somebody. Our government is someday going to have to make good on as a percent of our GDP, i.e. of the income the government has to draw on to pay that debt, to service that debt. Look at what's happened. And again, I just want to point out two things. You see the increase in the percentage between 2007 and 2009? I... I I'd expect that the economy was in a deep, deep recession and the federal government took on more debt to try and stimulate recovery. But look at what's happened since. From 49.7%, our debt held by the public as a percent of GDP has risen from 49.7% after the end of the Great Recession, all the way to 87.7% today, that is a concern. We're going to have to watch this very carefully. And as I said earlier, it's not even the absolute debt level. The interest that we're paying on that debt is squeezing out investments in infrastructure, education, and the like that would boost our economy's growth over the long term. And to be fair about it, it's not just America. When you get a minute, I want you to go to this website in red up here. This is the world debt clock, and it shows you how national debt is increasing by country after country. And it also shows you national debt as a percentage of the country's GDP, the ability to service that debt. Take a look at this when you have a chance. It's frightening. And I, I want you to see it for two reasons. Number one, it's not just us. Contrary to what you may hear, China is running up debt even faster than we are. And um, again, it's frightening. It's a concern. We may as well face it. We may as well be aware of it. Uh, final part of debt is consumer debt. And I put this in because, you know, the consumer is in fairly decent shape. Uh, we've taken on more debt. And here again, I measure everything as a percent of disposable income. So our debt has risen. Consumer debt was 22.4% of disposable income in 2010, the year after the Great Recession ended, and has risen to 25% uh, this year. Uh, not extraordinarily high, but um, will become more burdensome as the economy slows, as wage gains and compensation growth slows, uh, as interest rates rise. And, and the good news is consumer savings has increased uh, significantly. So of the three, corporate, federal, and the consumer, the consumer seems to be in the best shape. Bottom line, though, however you want to look at it, it is a huge amount of debt, a huge overhang that could very easily become a severe problem for the economy as growth slows, when interest rates again begin to rise, and one day they will, and we have to keep an eye on it very carefully. And I'm going to close with just two slides. That's the forecast. That's why I made the forecast that I did. Those are the reasons, uh, below the headline reasons, why the economy is likely to slow further next year but not collapse into recession. 
But here's what, uh, here's what we're going to have to watch. There are indicators we can watch to track how this actually plays out over the next years. And I'm going to show you three of them. Number one, I want you to track something called the index of unit labor costs. You go right up to the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics website, www.bls.gov. All free. You don't have to pay. You don't have to subscribe. You don't have to give anybody your email. This measures that absolutely essential relationship between wages and productivity. Ideally, we want compensation rising with productivity. If productivity starts to fall, then we have a problem. JOLTS, the Job Opening and Labor Turnover Survey, also from the BLS. You hear all the time about the unemployment rate. You hear all the time about how many jobs the economy has created. This is an equally important Labor Department report that never makes the headlines. Quit rates, an important measure of consumer confidence, job openings, layoffs, all things that tend to be leading economic indicators. Again, all for free, all right there for you to track at www.bls.gov. And finally, the conference board leading economic index, www.conferenceboard.org. As I said earlier, no economic indicator is perfect, not even housing starts. So the conference board combines 10 indicators into a very powerful index of leading indicators. Those indicators include initial claims for unemployment insurance, leading credit index, consumer expectations. All these things tend to move up before the economy moves up and move down before the economy moves down. Track it yourself, no cost, no inconvenience www.conferenceboard.org. And finally, I just close with this slide. That's what I believe is going to happen. This is an economic forecast. I gave you the forecast. I gave you all the reasons I expect that forecast to play out. I gave you reasons of what three indicators we should follow to see, in fact, how the economy is, is tracking as 2020, prog uh, 2020 progresses. Finally, the last piece, and frankly, I think the most important piece, so what do we do about it? The issue is not simply what's happening or what's likely ahead. The issue is what do we do right now to make what's happening and what's ahead an opportunity rather than a threat? Uh, the difference maker, you know, it's, it's helpful to do what we just did. It's helpful to talk about what's likely ahead. The difference maker, however, is knowing what we should do right now to make what's happening and what's ahead an opportunity rather than a threat. So SGIA has created something called Creating Opportunity, which is a neat summary of, of 20 actions any company in our industry, regardless of size, regardless of what they call themselves, regardless of their roles in our industry, any company can take right now to build a sustainable competitive advantage, to make whatever the economy decides to do next year, that company's opportunity and the competition's threat. And, and these actions cover, again, these, these universal, timeless must-dos. And I call them must-dos because that's what they are. They're, they're not things that are nice to do. They're things that we need to be doing to create a sustainable competitive advantage, such as hearing the voice of the customer more clearly, acting on the voice of the customer, Op option evaluation. Sure, it's creating a lot of buzz, but is it really an opportunity given my company's resources, capabilities, and circumstances? Strategy, figuring out where we want to go and how we're going to get there. Effective execution, even the most well thought out strategies and plans don't get us very far if we can't execute them. 
labor force development. No company, no industry prospers if it cannot recruit and retain and develop a skilled, productive labor force. It's all in creating opportunity. If you'd like a complimentary copy of it, just email me or my colleague Olga at the email addresses above. And if you have any questions on all that we just discussed, the forecast, why I think it's going to play out that way, and uh, what three indicators we need to watch as the year progresses, um, I'm easy to find. It's my email. It's my phone number. I'd be delighted to hear from you at any time. And thank you so much for your time and consideration. It was a pleasure. Uh, Andy, I think uh, <laughs> I don't know quite how to quite the right adjective for this. This is an amazing presentation. Oh, well, um, thank you. I'm so glad. People tell me how complicated postal stuff is. Postal stuff is like first grade that can, first grade math compared to the economics that you that you've described to us. It was really a comprehensive view of stuff, and certainly a good background for anybody who's a printer or a mailer or anything else. So, to, to use in, in assessing their economic outlook for next year. So I, I hope everyone who participated today really takes advantage of what you talked about and uses it in their planning for, for 2020. Um, that we had a question that's along the line about whether there was a recession coming, but you answered that. And otherwise, most folks are just, are just very complimentary about everything and, and, and deservedly so. Um, as Andy pointed out, if you have any questions for him, uh, he shared his email with you. Uh, and if you need anything, any of the materials that, that uh, he described today on that slide, which you will also get in your copy of the handouts, uh, he's offered to, cut, to, to share those with you if you just email him and let him know what you need. Um, I, I'm beyond that, I, I'm, I'm at a loss to think of an intelligent question to ask because I'm still, I'm still just amazed by, by the breadth of what you presented today. Um, I don't see any questions here. Uh, I don't think we have anything else coming in any place. So I, I think you've probably done um, done more than a great job here. Let's see. Oh, I, I, had a, I had one question here. Come, just come in. It says, do you have any ideas on how to correct the labor issue? Yeah, in fact, um, in uh, this creating opportunity thing I mentioned, uh, correcting the labor issue, is, is a two-part thing. In terms of our industry at large, I mean, we really have to make the case for our industry. Uh, we have to go into schools and we have to show kids the opportunities that our industry provides. We are a viable, vibrant, growing industry. People don't understand that. Uh, my relatives are all still amazed. They know I'm in the printing industry, they're all still amazed that, that I have a job. And <laughs> folks don't understand that our industry is expanding its role in communication. We're not dying. We're finding new and exciting ways to use print to help folks communicate more effectively. Uh, and I mentioned to you, Leo, that one of our studies, one of our SGIA studies, which, I'll, again, I'll be happy to share with the uh, audience, is shows that one of the most rapidly growing markets is highly personalized, targeted direct mail. Uh, so the answer is twofold. In terms of an industry, we have to make the case for our industry. No one is going to do it for us. We have to show folks the opportunities this industry offers. The other thing is for our individual companies, and I said a lot of this is about, well, we've got to, we've got to make what's happening an opportunity rather than a threat. For our individual companies, there is an action in that creating opportunity document I described called Building Our Employer Brand. And building our employer brand is about making ourselves, our companies, uh, a, a destination employer, the kind of place where uh, talented folks 
productive, skilled folks of all ages want to work. And it's an amazing, um, when I read it, it was an amazing assessment of what we can do to build our employer brand, uh, recruit, retain, and develop the kind of personnel we need. Uh, and it, it, it's, it follows the same kind of things we do to build our company brand, our product ba- brand. And it talks about a number of issues um, uh, that we can take, again, to make ourselves uh, very visible and very attractive to the kinds of employees that are going to move us forward. It's called Building Our Employer Brand. It's one of the 20 must-dos in that creating opportunity uh, presentation I mentioned. And it's, it's very effective in terms of, uh, again, the labor shortages as an industry at large, we've got to, we've got to take that on ourselves. Uh, we've got to take the initiative there. But as our individual companies, this building our employer brand is is how we insulate ourselves from uh, chronic severe labor shortages that uh, that are a real problem for our industry. Well, you know, it's it's odd that you make that point because the thing that I keep hearing or that I've heard repeatedly is that everybody who's in high school now. Uh, is encouraged to go to college and become a professional, this, that, or something else. And, and and young people are overlooking the fact that you can go to go to a school, become a plumber, electrician, uh, you know, get a job in a printing company, become a, 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 a the operator of a printing press, make good money, and always have a career. So I think what's happened not just in the printing industry or the mailing industry. But broadly in the trade uh, yeah. is that is that they've all been overlooked in favor of the things that are more uh, more more glamorous, more you know, offer the the potential for a lot of money. If you're going to be a, a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, well, all those who try to be doctors and lawyers and baseball players and artists and go for the big money forget that along the way many fall off. And if they don't have a, pr- a practical way to earn a living or have a trade. They're going to staff our, our fast food restaurants instead of having the kind of careers they want. That's a great point, Leo. It really is a, a problem for the American economy at large, and and that's that's what I was mentioning earlier that that these kinds of labor shortages of skilled, productive personnel are a drag on the economy, and um, that's exactly what is happening. These kids are being um, directed into college where they incur a whole lot of debt and never the earning power to service that debt. Uh, and, um, you know, even, even my experience has been even in schools that are a little more receptive to sending kids to a trade school to become an electrician, a welder, a Mason, uh, something when, when they talk to these kids, these talented, skilled kids, who know that college is not for me. I want to work hard. I want to make, be an entrepreneur. I want to create a, a business. I want to do something. Printing doesn't come up in the conversation. Oh, maybe they'll talk about welding. They'll talk about uh, electrician. They'll talk about all kinds of stuff. But there's such a, a terrible misconception of, of our industry. Uh, and, um, you know, that's really what we've got to change. But you're absolutely right. It is a universal problem, uh, industry-wide, uh, economy-wide problem in America. And, um, you know, it's it's something that um, that is going to have to change if America is going to continue to grow productively uh, and, and support increases in uh, lifestyle. Uh, but for our industry, we 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 gotta we we gotta do this ourselves. I keep people keep asking, well, what does the Bureau of the Bureau of Labor Statistics doesn't give a damn about us? The Bureau of Labor Statistics isn't going to do anything for us. We we gotta somehow figure out a way to to do it ourselves. And I know PI the um, uh, John Berthelsen's group, the uh, Graphic Arts Scholarship Foundation, does a good job. But when I talk to people, they they don't even know the kind of resources that Berthelsen and his group put together to 
encourage kids to consider our industry as a career for all the reasons you just mentioned? Well, it's only been over the past two or three years that there's been any any effort to develop programs in colleges that, that talk about the graphic arts. And I, I mean, mm -hmm. soup to nuts graphic arts and design, uh, you know, using the direct mail, printed materials, and so forth. Because before that, it was just a matter of, well, there was no, there was nothing, that, you know, to speak of it at the college level, even at the high mm -hmm. school level, is little to make to get kids involved in in things that would benefit the the mailing and printing industry. So your point's well taken. It's, it really falls to all of us to, to try to make people uh, in, make people more aware of what's needed and and have that translate into uh, education, training, and 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 related efforts at the uh, at the at the high school and college level to to get to get next the next generation of of of, of uh, mailing and printing company uh, workers and executives for that matter. Exactly. So that, that's that, a great point. That that's it. Well, we have, we have, no, go ahead. No, I was going to say, we have a great story to tell. It's not like we have to blow smoke. We we got a great industry and a great story to tell. And, and you're right. It's, it's, well, better late than never, you know, at least we've gotten started. And I just, I just urge the listeners who are, and I apologize. It's John Berthelsen's group. It's the printing industry scholarship, graphic arts scholarship foundation. They have terrific materials. They have prepared specifically to go into schools and show kids and show them the kind of opportunity that they have in our industry. Well, uh, we should all we should all get that and use it then. I think. Absolutely. Well, we have we have consumed the hour uh, very usefully, very very you know, very worthwhile information and discussion. Uh, so I want to make sure we don't take up too much time for our for our um, our listeners today. But I want to before we finish, I want to thank you very very much Certainly. for all you've done here. And obviously, I owe you <laughs> for doing this. No, so please call up. My us. pleasure. We have a good thing for you. I want to uh, remind everybody. Of course, we have the recording available for subscribers. We have the handouts available for those of you who called in today. And if you have any questions for for Andy, there's his contact information. Of course, you know how to reach us at Mailers Hub if you have any questions of us. Andy, again, thank you for, uh, 10 times over. Uh, I look forward to, to picking your brain again sometime. And uh, if we can ever do anything to, to, to share what we have on this side, you know you have friends in the, in the mailing community uh, to call upon. Thanks again to all of you. Thank you, Michelle, for being the, the first keeping the lights on on the, the webinar. And uh, we'll talk to everyone later. Until then, bye. Thanks. All right. Thanks again. Bye now.